Welcome home. I'm Dr. Tama, a minister, licensed psychologist, and sacred artist. And this is Homecoming, a podcast to facilitate your journey home to yourself. While I will provide weekly inspiration and mental health tips, this podcast is not a substitute for therapy. I'm so excited you're on the journey. If you want to request specific topics or share your progress, email me at homecomingpodcast at gmail.com. Also, after you listen, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Let's begin. Welcome home, co-journers. I am so glad to see you, to hear you, to be with you for another week. And I'm excited. We have a poetry submission and those who want to send in their poetry about your homecoming journey, you can send it to me at homecomingpodcast at gmail.com. And this week's submission is from Carol Hall, who writes about the use of her faith as she is on her homecoming journey. And so her piece is called Get Your Voice Back. And I'm going to read an excerpt from her poem, Get Your Voice Back, a voice that creates, innovates, and plans, a voice that listens with life-giving breath, a voice that leads in confidence through the resurrection power of Jesus, a voice that shares wisdom without want of return, a voice that is gracious enough to receive when men and women want to give and provide. A voice that gives from the heart and trusts in God's good, good blessings that promises to bring riches and add no sorrow. A voice that sows seeds of kindness and integrity. A voice that forgives and reaps resilience. A passionate voice that will not give up on life as God gives strength. A voice that receives God's portion of grace, mercy, and favor and prays for God's divine direction. A voice that when I am weak, through God's wonder-working power, I am strong. A voice that lives and receives love. A voice that will never die, but blossoms again and again through well-lived lives of faith for generations to come. Be intentional. Find your God-given voice. It's a choice. Thank you so much, Carol, for sharing your poem with us. We definitely appreciate it and recognize that importance of reclaiming our voice. And we even had an episode on reclaiming our voice as we reclaim our lives on this homecoming journey. And so I welcome all of you that are listening from your various traditions and cultures and countries uh, that we are on this journey of reclaiming our voice and our possibility. And so this piece is in alignment for our sharing on today. And I want to talk um, today about a topic that is often avoided uh, in therapy or in uh, mental health and psychology conversations, unless the client brings it up. And it's very important. And so our topic on today is money and mental health money and mental health. And it is really important that we start from the acknowledgement that our resources, our finances, and our lack of resources and finances have an impact on our psychology. And I want to first start off with really debunking the myth that says Uh, that wealth creation is just a matter of your mind. And that is that kind of toxic positivity where um, people will say that uh, the only thing that is blocking you from being wealthy is your mindset. And I want you to know that is a myth and a lie. And it is also victim blaming. Um, It does, while there is Um, a psychological component to the ways in which uh, we approach money, and I'm going to talk about that, I want to be very clear 
uh, that this is not one of those teachings that says um, that those who are wealthy have the right mindset and the positive mindset and those that are impoverished do not uh, because that really ignores the systems and structures that exist um, that first of all, we did not all start from the same place financially and economically. And there is the reality of not only intergenerational wealth, but also intergenerational poverty. And so it is really important that before we start comparing where we are to where other people are, that we look beyond the individual path, the individual life, and really look socially, historically, looking at our family legacy, looking at there are those who not only didn't receive uh, an inheritance, a financial inheritance from the people who came before you, but there are even uh, young people who inherited their parents' debt, right? And uh, their parents also lack of access, knowledge, or information as it relates to uh, finances. And we also want to be mindful uh, that there is the reality um, that many people work very hard and do not receive a livable wage. And so we want to debunk the myth of a meritocracy. So a meritocracy, it, it means that the system is based on merit. And so the harder you work, uh, the more you make. And we know as we look globally and nationally um, that that is a myth. There are people who work very hard all day long, who work multiple jobs and are still financially struggling. And there are those who do not have to work, um, but who inherited wealth. And so uh, we want to really be careful about those kinds of um mindset teaching, psychology teaching, pseudoscientific, uh, that's like false science uh, teaching that um, it is just a matter of your mindset, right? So I invite you to, as you look at your financial circumstances, to be aware of all of the factors that have led to where you are, right? And this does not mean um, that we are not addressing our individual contribution to where we are, and I'm going to get to that. But it really is important from the standpoint of decolonizing psychology, looking at context, right, that we really understand um, how you landed uh, where you are. So not only, quote unquote, personal responsibility, um, but the realities of classism, uh, the realities that people of color are more likely to have faced uh, intergenerational poverty versus transient poverty, right? What does that mean? So transient poverty is I was doing fine and then I got laid off. So I had a little setback. Everyone in my family was equipped to help me. And then I got back on my feet, right? So it's temporary. Intergenerational poverty is when I don't have it and no one in my family has it. So I know many of you who are listening are uh, first timers for your family. Uh, for example, first time graduating uh, from college or first time getting a certain level of employment. And so what comes with that um, often is a sense of responsibility um, for those in your family um, who are really having a difficult time. And so when we think about income, people often just look at the numerical amount of what do you make, um, but we also want to consider who are the people that are being supported by that amount, right? And um, if anything happens to you in your uh, job and your employment, then what are the resources and supports that are available to you? Uh, we often think about social support as emotional social support, and that is people who can be there for me in terms of um, when I am grieving, 
when I am sad, when I am angry, um, that I can get comfort from them in terms of my emotions. And that's very important. But there's another kind of social support that's called instrumental social support. And those are, do you have people in your circle who can and would help you if you were having a difficult time, right? So if you were $50 or $100 short on your rent, or if you were uh, didn't have um, your mortgage for the month, do you know anybody who could and would help you? Um, if you had a job interview and no transportation, is there someone in your circle who uh, could either loan you their car or loan you uh, car fare, bus fare, so you could get to the interview? Um, is there someone in your circle who is trustworthy, who could watch your children if you needed to go um, in order to have an interview or to go to work? Uh, so, and then if you're working, is it really a livable wage, right? So we want to start off with that awareness of uh, what are the different factors within me and around me currently and historically that have shaped my financial life? And so, of course, when, when I do that inventory, it's not that I want to then remain stuck there, right, or have a sense of hopelessness or powerlessness, but I have to have a clear picture of these different factors so that when I am working toward my empowerment, the empowerment of my family and our community, that I am mindful of all of these different pieces of the puzzle as opposed to just uh, kind of beating my head against the wall of just saying it's just something wrong with me when often there are systems and structures and barriers in place um, that we want to collectively work to dismantle. Um, I posted this week about um, unhealthy relationships and the importance about when you escape one, not returning to another one. And one of the comments that was shared was, you know, it is very difficult not to return when you don't have stable housing. And so I think that is so important to name in this homecoming journey that our choices and options um, are often shaped by our circumstances and what we perceive, see, or experience as being available to us. So I want uh, us to be mindful of that. The next really important point about money and mental health is the realities of stress and fear that uh, many people are uh, struggling with the, the worries of will it be enough? Right. And we see this kind of across the spectrum of so many people uh, not feeling like uh, they have a sense of stability um, or security or a safety net. And we know, particularly in this time, so many people um, have faced uh, layoffs or challenges in uh, business and in finance and to uh, release the the stress, or I want to say the silence around the stress. Uh, many times we are taught, you know, not to talk about money, not to talk about politics, not to talk about religion, and not to talk about sex, right? Sex, religion, money, politics, often those are conversations people avoid. And I want to name that even if you haven't been talking about it with people, um, it can be a major worry. It can contribute to insomnia, to panic, to depression, uh, to anxiety, and it can shape our behavior, you know, whether that is acting out as a result of being irritable or engaging in things that really would not be our first choice, but feeling financially pressured or stuck in some ways. And so I wonder if on today, you can acknowledge uh, the stress that you have experienced, uh, whether past or present or your whole life, um, as it relates to resource and resource access. And I invite you to also reflect on what did you see growing up in terms of your parents and 
Uh, some parents were kind of protective and didn't let children know uh, that there were struggles or difficulties. And uh, for some, the, you know, as a child, you may have been very much aware um, of there not being enough. Um, you may have lived with uh, food insecurity or housing insecurity. And so even if you are in a more stable place now, I encourage you to think about the ways in which you might still hold those wounds, uh, the ways in which that early fear and anxiety may continue to shape the way you approach your finances, the way you approach your life choices, uh, that sometimes that, that dread of, I never wanna be in that place again, of being embarrassed or being uh, dependent on people who don't mean me uh, good, uh, that that kind of urgency and pressure and stress can affect the way we are living our lives, which uh, raises the, another point, which is our financial uh, experiences and stressors and mindset uh, can be a major source of conflict in relationships. And so sometimes uh, when I'm doing premarital counseling, uh, the couple is startled when I start to talk about money because we have often centered the dialogue on love, affection, communication, and all those things are important. And, and uh, there are people who love each other who have never discussed their debt, right? There are people who love each other who are, you know, uh, working toward marriage, walking toward marriage, and don't have a sense um, of what each other has, both uh, in terms of resource, in terms of debt, in terms of their approach to saving and spending, uh, that these are dialogues that we, you know, will just say, well, we love each other. And I'll tell you that love is an important thing, uh, but uh, financial decision making can be very uh, disruptive to a union when people are on a different page. And I want to name that uh, sometimes it's not a matter of uh, one person being wrong and the other person being right. Sometimes it's just different, right? Uh, different styles, different priorities. And this becomes a dynamic uh, sometimes around gender roles when um, you know someone is saying that I will decide what are the important purchases for this household, um, but the things they enjoy are put on the list of priorities and the things the other person enjoys are considered uh, inconsequential or insignificant, right? So it is really important for our own psychology and wellness uh, that we start to be open about reflecting uh, on money and its impact on our mental health, but also for us to consider the ways in which it um, can affect relationships and marriage and parenting, you know, and what are the lessons that we want to teach about that. Uh, speaking of which, another uh, mental health issue that comes up around money is also when I'm providing counseling for families that are wealthy, who are concerned about how do I raise children who are compassionate, who are generous, uh, who are um, non-elitist, right? When um, I have resources or I am able to give them um, access and opportunities to incredible things. And you know what I share with those families is that doesn't happen by accident. You have to really be intentional, you know, being intentional about the way that you speak about money, the way that you even speak about people who do not have it. Um, even looking at our own friendship circle, right? Is you know, do I relate to people across um, financial and educational? Uh, circumstances, right? Or is my mindset, um, these are 
people who are good, who are worthy, who are successful, and those people are either to be uh, people who are living in poverty or either to be looked down on or to be pitied or to be judged um, or to be ignored. And so, you know, when I'm talking with parents around this issue, it really starts by us modeling, right, our own example because children aren't just listening to the way we speak about people and the way we speak about money, but they're looking at our behavior, right? How do we act in particular circumstances? Um, How do we speak about groups of people, about neighborhoods, um, about lack and poverty, uh, and even how we speak about homelessness? Yes. So you want to really be mindful of that wherever you find yourself um, in, in the area of resource and finance. I want to also name that for many people, there can be shame uh, associated with our um, financial status or standing. And there can be uh, an embarrassment of not wanting people to know um, what we have or don't have. And I was uh, thinking about that when I went to college, I was struck that uh, many of the best dressed people um, were people who I knew um, were financially struggling. And, um, you know, I talked to my mom about that. My uh, mother grew up uh, with incredible, wonderful uh, family, but financially struggling. And uh, she described it as fear of the appearance of poverty, fear of the appearance of poverty. And so, you know, there can be this um, constant need for the name brands, right? And, you know, to really look like I have a lot and not wanting to be perceived of as not belonging. And so that can... Uh, cause us to make some financial uh, decisions that uh, create more debt and struggle because I am trying to purchase things that will make people believe that I have more than I actually have, right? So I encourage you to think about uh, any shame or embarrassment you have held about what you had or where you live or what your family has. Um, or, you know, what you had access to, because sometimes, you know, we have talked about shame as it relates to trauma, but it is also important to think about shame as it relates to education and money and finance uh, for ourselves, our family, even our community, uh, to be able to name it so we can heal it. We need to name it, become aware of it, Uh, so that we can really free ourselves from the lie, from the myth that my net worth is an indication of my self-worth. And that is a lie, right? If we, you know, we growing up in in a society uh, that is very much into capitalism and competition, uh, there can really be this sense of depending on where you live, you're better, or where you, how you dress, that makes you better, how much you make, that makes you better. And we load that uh, on each other. And this, you know, consumerism and um, all of the, the media messages of that, of like it never being enough and always needing more. And I um, invite you uh, to really take uh, the blinders off and see the possible weight of what you have been carrying as it relates to your own worth and value, even that languaging we use, right? Worth and value, right? Our financial terms. Um, but for us to really uh, come home to the sacredness of our identity, to honor who we are, however much we make, wherever we live, however much education our family had, for us to really come home to the truth of who we are at our core, being not measured by how much we have in the bank, 
I want to also name as it relates to money that a lot of us deal with being workaholics. And uh, that can look very noble, right? If people say you should work hard, it is very important to work hard, but we can do that in such a way that we are destroying our own health, that we destroy our relationships, that we miss out on living uh, because we are constantly stuck in this cycle. And I know for some people, you know, you, you find yourself in a season where you're having to do all of these hours just to, you know, keep a roof over your head or, you know, to provide for your children. Um, so I, I want to be aware of that and really compassionate about that. And I also want to identify that there are some who are listening who it really is not a matter of survival causing you to work those hours, um, but your own stress and anxiety and fears that can cause us to miss out on living, that can cause us to lose sight of ourselves, our values, our family, to not have any space even for joy. And so that's why we did the episode on play and joy, because uh, you're worthy, you know, with, with all of the bills and all of those challenges that uh, we are worthy of also having some rest and some joy and some connection uh, in our lives. And I mentioned bills, so I do want to name that some of us have been uh, operating with avoidance. And I want you to know a bill that you do not open is still a bill, right? It, it did not go away because we just fit all those uh, envelopes aside. And so we want to be proactive in this season of our lives that for my homecoming, I want to really get a sense of uh, my debt and what I owe. I want to really get a sense of my budget and what I am spending and on what. I want to get a sense uh, of honestly the ways in which I may be living above my means that I am uh, adding to my stress with some of my life choices. And so uh, really needing to be honest with ourselves so we can start making uh, decisions for our growth and empowerment. And so I invite you to shift out of avoidance and out of denial and really start to create a plan. You know, what is the plan uh, for my uh, financial freedom or growth? What is my plan to not have to perpetually live with this fear and worry? You know, what is my plan for perhaps the things I was never taught, but I want to teach my children? You know, what is my plan for identifying the habits that are sabotaging me, that are not working for me, uh, that are a dead end? And so being engaged and intentional is so important. And then uh, the last point I want to make is uh, getting comfortable advocating and knowing your worth. And what I discovered um, in psychology is that women and people of color are the least likely to negotiate salary. You know, we often are so glad we just got the job or the position that we don't negotiate salary we uh, don't uh, advocate for ourselves when it comes to raises or promotions. And so I invite you to not only think about your internal awareness around money and finance, but I also invite you to think about uh, advocating for yourself, um, whether that is in employment arenas, whether that is that you work for yourself. And so not giving away all of your uh, resources and gifts, uh, that we're constantly doing favors for people and not really uh, handling or acknowledging the truth that what we are doing uh, is often labor, right? And so what are the ways that you want to shift internally 
around money? What are the ways you want to talk about it more or with your children or in your therapy? And then what are the steps to advocate for yourself as you move forward in this journey home? I invite your soul to tell your heart, mind, body, and spirit, welcome home. <laughs>